El salir del sol no se compara con tu belleza y tu esplendor Y me da calor, puedo sentir tu amor Por tu mano todo fue creado Te tengo hoy libertad, ahora puedo bailar No puedo contener tu amor Me inunda el mar de tu
got no doubt We can change the world with just one word I believe it, so should you Hell to the OVE is what we really need I can feel it breaking through Everywhere we go, cities high and low We all need to show We got love, yeah People of all kinds, places far and wide We all need to know
Good morning. I'm Pastor Kathy, the pastor of St. John's United Methodist Church, the church in Watts with Watson Heart. I thank God for you joining us today, whether it's um, here in the sanctuary or whether it's here in the um, space that you've carved out to be your very own for this time of worship. All right, for those of us that are on the conference call, I thank God for you. I thank God for your witness. I thank God for your 97 years. And I thank God for those that would join us on this journey, whether it's on YouTube or whether it's on Facebook Live or whether it's on the conference call. I thank God for you because it's because of you God continues to encourage me and to pour in me the witness, even when I'm discouraged and ready to call it quit. It's God's spirit through you, the very image of God that encourages me to press on. Let us worship God in spirit and in truth, despite where you are, despite where you're, what you're going through, despite the world around us, that we pause to worship God in spirit and in truth. Let us pray, God, we thank you that you never leave us nor forsake us. We thank you, God that you have all of this in your hands. And because you have all of this in your hands, God, we can come to you with assurance that you have our back. Let us be in your presence as we worship you in spirit and in truth. To God be the glory, hallelujah. Join me in the call to worship. Sing to the Lord and bless God's name. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord.
Let us pray. God, we come in the name of Jesus. Through the blood, God, we come praying, thanking you, God, for who you are. We come praying, God, for the goodness, God, that you continue to pour out in us. And God, I know so many times that we are um, wondering what's going on in the world, God, but we turn to you knowing, God, that you are a rock and our sustainer. God, we know that indeed if we come to you, if we come to you, God, with a humble heart, God, for your word says the prayers of the right righteous availeth much. And God, we come now seeking you, God. We come now, God, asking that you would touch us, God, from ways that we would feel your presence and know your power. God, we come knowing that you are God and you're God by yourself. God, we know that we have made so many other little gods with a small G, God, but you are our big God with a big G, God, and you're Lord of Lord. And we just thank you. And God, as we come, we just ask that you would forgive us. Forgive us for those things that we've said, those things that we've done, God, those things that we held in our heart. God, that we're unpleasing to you, that we would worship you, God, in spirit and in truth and through the blood of Jesus, that you would cleanse us, God, and bring to our consciousness those things that would draw us away from you. And God, we come praying for the chaos and the confusion that exists in the world, the chaos and confusion around COVID-19, the chaos and confusion around this political climate, the chaos and confusion, God, in families, the chaos and confusion on the streets, God, the chaos and confusion among those that are called the haves and the have-nots. God, we come through the blood of Christ Jesus asking God that you would, that you would allow those that are in power, God, to open their heart, to open their mind, to open their knowledge base, God, to seek the wisdom of those around us. God, we pray for those that are in the midst of the fires here in California, God, for those that have lost their physical space of dwelling, God, those that have lost their materials, God, but we thank you for their life. And God, we pray for those that have lost life. We pray for their family, God. We pray for their absence. And God, we pray that the grief that people are experiencing, God, that you would meet them right where they are, God, that in their grief, and then being feel, feeling overwhelmed, God, that, that you would just be, that they would feel your presence right next to them, God. And that the heavy load that they carry, God, that they would cast their burdens on you. For Jesus said that he would carry our burdens, God, and we just thank you. That those that are in the valley of grief, that they would allow Jesus to carry their burdens. They would allow Jesus to feel their pain. They would allow Jesus, God, to be taken at his word and God we are so thankful we thank you for the relationship we thank you for God you continuing to knock at the door and God we pray for those that are desiring to open it God but fear has riddled them we just ask through the blood of Christ Jesus that fear would dissipate and that your healing touch and God we pray for the churches that are debating to go back to their place of physical worship God we pray that your wisdom would overshadow us in ways God that would give us understanding that would give us the knowledge that we need God to be safe for everyone and God we just ask this through the blood of Christ Jesus for the witness that we are in you for God we know that without you we are nothing and because we are somebody in you God we just thank you and we give you praise and glory God, we thank you for the word that will come forth. God, we thank you for the seeds that already have been planted. God, we thank you for those that have watered. And God, we thank you for the increase, God, that you said in your word, that your word would not come back void. And we are forever grateful, God. And that when the time comes, God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our collective hearts, God, be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Through the blood of Christ Jesus. Amen. 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 Our scripture lesson is taken from Exodus, the 33rd chapter, verses 12 to 23. Moses said to the Lord, See, you have said to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. 
Now, if I have found favor in your sight, show me your ways so that I may know you and find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. He said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And he said to him, if your presence will not go, do not carry us up from here. For now, excuse me, for how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight? I and your people, unless you go with us. In this way, we shall be distinct. I and your people from every people on the face of the earth. The Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing that you have asked. For you have found favor in my sight and I know you by name. Moses said, show me your glory, I pray. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you the name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face for no one shall see me and live. And the Lord continued, see, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts collectively be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Today, I come to you on October the 18th as we look at the theme, Wilderness, Say My Name. Now, I know that the common phrase may be, say her name, has become the battle cry of the people after the death of Breonna Taylor, killed while sleeping in her living space. In our culture, we teach young people to respect older persons by calling them by Mr., Mrs., Miss, or Uncle, or Auntie. I recognize in other parts of our culture, we find it acceptable to call one another by our first name, but yet I'm mindful that when I received my doctorate, that my Aunt Cat, my Auntie Cat, um, started calling me Dr. Wilborn, and I started laughing because I thought that was just the funniest thing because I had never heard her call me anything other than Michelle. Her calling me Dr. Wilborn sounded foreign, and I preferred to have that family connection rather than a professional connection. I met a new coworker recently, an older man, and I quickly asked him, what shall I call him? Because I wanted to be respectful, and because we were in between cultures, our culture together and a subculture that we both worked in, I wanted to make sure that he knew that I knew his name, how to properly address him and let him know and tell me how I was to say his name. Names are important. It helps us self-identify, but also helps us be in context of where we are. I remember I declared my name to be Kathy Michelle and the great Reverend Robert Smith stood up one Sunday at Calvary United Methodist Church and declared my name Kathy Michelle. Well, another brother in the church had told me not to draw attention by changing my name after getting divorced. But yet when Reverend Smith stood up and declared my name, there was something about him proclaiming the freedom that existed in Kathy Michelle. And yet people started calling me Kathy Michelle. There's something about saying our name calling us name by name by name, whether it's my brothers calling me Shell or my parents calling me Michelle or my daughter calling me mommy. There's something about the name that we're addressed by. And some people are called by different names. I remember when Cornish Rogers said to me at the School of Theology to tell Bob, I said, hello. I had no clue who he was talking about, but yet as I asked him who was Bob, he told me Robert Smith. I had never heard anybody call Reverend Dr. Robert Smith Bob. And when I conveyed this to Reverend Smith, he said, that is not my name, but somehow Cornish thought that that was his name, but I dared not call him Bob. Our text today is from Exodus 33, 12 to 23. We continue in this wilderness story of Moses, Aaron, and the Israelites. That we know that the wilderness is this place where the Israel's, Israelites are led out of when they leave, led into rather, when they leave Egypt. There's something about the story of the wilderness for these past several weeks that has turned into like a month, I think, that helps us focus on what it means to be enslaved people, what it means to cry out to God, what it means to stay the course, what it means to complain and wander, because we know that as the Israelites came out of the wilderness, they faced the Red Sea, that they faced not having um, food, so God provided manna and bread for them. God even provided water, but yet we know that as Moses went up to get the tablets that the people started grumbling and wondering when was Moses going to come, having separation anxiety having some trauma-informed um, relationships with Aaron and that they, they break the second commandment making this golden calf to worship as a god. And yet we find ourselves still here in the wilderness. But today's topic, wilderness, say my name, is a little different because Moses is having this intimate conversation with God. And in this intimate conversation with God, there's something about Moses and God's relationship that Moses is able to talk very frankly to God in ways that he may not talk to God in front of the people. There's something about Moses interceding with 
um, on the people's behalf, being that mediator. But we see here in Exodus 33, 12 to 23, there's something about Moses' encounter with God that helps him better understand who God is. Our text is this conversation between Moses and God. What an intimate conversation we are about to witness. Learn something about Moses, learning something about God, and using our Christian lens, our Christian lens, to understand the power of the rock, the power of being in God's presence, the power of experiencing God's glory. The word of God says, Moses said to the Lord, see, you have said to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. I find this kind of striking, if I may interject, a little confusing even, because when God called Moses, Moses um, convinced God that he was not um, he didn't have the communication ability, the, the speaking skills. So God told him he would send his brother Aaron with him. There's something about this conversation that Moses asked God, who will you send is a little confusing. So that lets me know that from an oral tradition to a written tradition, that maybe something got intermixed or conversations got intertwined. But nevertheless, this is why it is important to make sure you hear the whole conversation rather than pieces of the conversation. I know you by name and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, if I have found favor in your sight, show me your way so that I may know you and find favor in your sight. There's something about this witness that Moses says to God that if you know me by name and if you, have, if I found favor in your sight, there's something that I want from you. And Moses said, this witness of saying to God in this mingled conversation between the people of God and Moses' interaction with God. He said, "My God says to Moses, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And he said to him, if your presence, this is Moses talking to God, if your presence will not go, do not carry us from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight and I and your people unless you go with us? In this way, we shall be distinct. I and your people from every people on the face of the earth. This makes me think because a few verses before, there's this intermingle where God says that I know you by name and that I'm going to go with you. And then here in this next verse, um, verse 16, um, Moses says, well, if you don't go with us, the people won't know who we are. So it's like this conversation like, are you talking to one another? Or are you talking at each other? But finally in 17, the Lord says to Moses, I will do the very thing that you have asked. Hallelujah. Have, have you ever asked God for something in that? If you, you didn't wait long enough for God to give you the answer that I will do the very thing that you asked or that we ask God for something and we realize that we shouldn't have asked for it because God gave it to us despite it not being good for us. I think that's why with my Christian lens, when Jesus says, when you pray, pray like this, thy will be done because our way is not God's way often the time. And we see with the physical eye, but God sees with the spiritual eye. But yet, getting back to the text here in Exodus 33, the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing that you have asked, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Hallelujah, that God knows Moses by name. God tells Moses, I know you by name. And Moses said, <laughs> I like this. Moses said, <laughs> it, it doesn't it doesn't reflect here, but in 21st century language, we would say that Moses then took the prerogative to say to God in verse 18, show me your glory, I pray. As if God didn't know what Moses already was praying, that Moses says, show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you the name, the Lord. Now, God already knows Moses by name, and yet Moses wants to see God's glory. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said... God says to Moses, when Moses says, show me your glory, God says, you cannot see my face for no one shall see me and live. 
And the Lord continued, seeing there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. Oh, glory, hallelujah. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock. And I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Oh, that's so powerful. It's so powerful that Moses understand that God knows him by name. And because God knows him by name and Moses understands that he can have this intimate conversation with God. And Moses asks God to show me your glory. In this pandemic, many of us are wailing and crying out before God. God, in the midst of this pandemic, show us your glory. God, in the midst of this um, isolation from family and friends, show us your glory. God, in the midst of this political rhetoric on all levels, local, um, national, and global, show us your glory. But what you and I do know from our past experience with God, by God knowing us by our name through the blood of Christ Jesus, we know that when God shows up, you know God shows out, does he not? So that we see that in this powerful interchange, Moses goes to God. Moses talks to God like a buddy, like a homeboy, like a friend, like a neighbor, an ordinary person. But something about that encounter gives Moses the courage, the tenacity, the um to say, show me your glory. It seems that some of the conversation between 12 to 23 is this two different conversations. So we have to ask ourselves, sisters and brothers living in the post-resurrection Age. What does it mean to have this intimate conversation with God? Are you in a relationship with God where God knows your name? And that sometimes when we pray, we may say, God, this is Kathy coming to you. God, this is Shell coming to you. God, this is Mo coming to you. God, this is Dr. Wilborn coming to you. But if I'm in an intimate relationship with God, I don't have to call my name. I don't have to call what my brothers call me or what my mother calls me or what my daddy calls me or what my friends calls me or what my co-workers call me I can say God is me standing in the need of prayer if we're in this intimate relationship with God as we see Moses had with God and God said that God says that he knows them by name God knows us by name that we're created in the very image of God. And because we're created in the very image of God, let us be clear that God knows us from the top of our head to the bottom of our feet. God knows what we think and how we think it though. God wants us to come to God in ways that we would acknowledge that we are God. That we are God, not that we are gods, but that we are gods, belonging, possession, that we've declared God as our Lord and Savior, that God as our Alpha and our Omega. Now, we look at this as post-resurrection people, people that have come to know the teachings of Jesus Christ. And because we've come to know God's word, God's wilderness experience with the Israelites and Moses through the lenses of Jesus' life his birth, life, death, and resurrection, that we read into this, that when God says that you're not going to be able to see me, because if you see me, you won't live. So God provides instructions to Moses that you may not be able to see me, but Moses didn't ask to see God. He asked to see God's glory. Some of us are looking for a tangible something, but that we need to understand that it may not be the tangible that we need, but it may be God's glory. Hallelujah. It may be God's presence. Hallelujah. It may be us seeing with the spiritual eye what is right before our very eyes. Hallelujah. There's something about Moses saying to God, show me your glory. And God saying that you can't see me and live. Be clear what you ask God. People of God, created in God's image, loved by God, desiring the witness of God in your life, that when we come to God in this intimate relationship, talking to God, 
because God already knows us, knows our name. There's something about God saying to Moses, I'm going to put my hand in front of you. There's something about when we put our hand in front of something that it covers the whole something. So if I look at the mountains and put my hand at a certain angle, it covers the whole mountain. And you and I both know that my hands are not that big, that it's going to cover the whole mountain. But in the perception of the angle of things, it's covered. And that we see that when God put Moses in that place, the place that God put him at, by where he shall stand on the rock. <laughs> stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock and will cover you with my hand until I pass by. Oh, say my name. Say my name. There's something about this interaction that as God takes away his hand, that Moses sees his backside. People of God, I say to you, have you asked God to show you God's glory? Have you asked God that in Jesus coming that we might have a right to the tree of life? As we come understanding things through the Christian lens, through the lens of post-resurrection, do we understand that in this post-resurrection community called the Christian, this post-resurrection community where Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also that. Do we understand that Jesus is our rock? Jesus asked the disciples, who do some say that I am? They replied, some say Moses, some say Elijah, some say the prophet. And then Jesus said, but who do you say I am? And Peter responded, Mess the Messiah, son of the living God. And Jesus said, on this rock, despite the debate that happens in the theological circles of whether it was on what Peter said, the Messiah, the living son, or on what Peter himself represented. But I would make the argument that Jesus was implying that on the Messiah, on the son of the living God, I shall build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail. So that we in the Christian context, in a post-resurrection lens, understand that Jesus is our rock. We understand that when we build a foundation in our life, that we need to build it on a rock. That one is like a man building a house who dug deeply and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood rose, you know there's floods in life. There's floods in life. There's situations in life. There's storms in life. You know, when the storms of life are raging, stand by me. We know floods come. Is not this pandemic a flood? Is not this unemployment rate a flood? Is not the death of so many um, people that look like me a, a flood? The river burst. This ideal of this political um, tension, this, this river of people bursting over um, police brutality, the bursting of um, equality, the bursting of right and the wrongs that have been done here in the narrative of the American story. There's something about the floods of life. There's something about the rivers. There's something about things that will shake us. I'm not talking about the earthquake. I'm talking about things that come to our life that shake us, whether that's a relationship or a child that's not acting the way we want that child to work to act or whether it's the shutdown of our, our worshiping space. There's things in life that shake us, that, that try to make us lose our foundation. But if we are standing on the rock of our faith, if we are standing on that which God has given us, if we're standing on the understanding that we serve a God that knows us by name, not a God that when we pay, you know, um, there's some times in life that when you're in a position, people know your name. But when you get out that position, oh, you don't know what I'm talking about. People may not even recognize your face. But I tell you today, sisters and brothers, I thank God that God knows my name from the sun up to the sun down. From the time I came out my mother's womb to the time I lay down in the grave or be cremated. I thank God that God knows my name. But today, it's not about me, people. It's about you asking yourself what does it mean to be connected to a God that knows us by name? What does it mean for us to have a God that will hide us in the cliff 
of life that will allow us to be sheltered in ways that the storms of life don't take us out, that the floods of life don't take us out, that the river bursting don't take us out. There's something about the God, this God that loves us. There's the song that says, Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. There's, there's this understanding of the songwriter that through the blood, through the life, through the death of Jesus Christ, that we are hid in the cliff. Moses was put in the cliff for the glory of God could pass by. And you and I witness the teachings of Christ Jesus. The songwriter said, on Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is seeking sand. Today, sisters and brothers, I asked you, in looking at Moses, in looking at the wilderness experience of the Israelites, what shall be your story? How do I call you by name? God knows you by name. Every name you ever been called, God knows you by name. God knows you by name. And because God knows you by name, God is our rock in this weary land. People of God, I invite you not to be weary. God has this. And that as God has this, let us look for the witness of God's glory. Let us look for it. Let us look for it. There's something about this rock. Jesus, Moses stood on the rock and was hid by God in the cleft. And that same God that did this for Moses sent us Christ Jesus. That we would have our own rock. That we can stand. That we can have a foundation. If you are still looking for a way to see God's glory. I invite you just to look in the mirror. You are a part of God's glory. And I thank God for it. To God be the glory for who you are. Because God knows you by name. And because God knows you by name. Don't let that person that calls you out of your name rock your foundation because you can stand on a strong foundation, Christ Jesus. God bless you, and until we meet again. Chasing after you, no matter what.